Okay, in this particular recording, I'm, I'm recording the last um, word problems that are in your book. And so I'm going to go ahead and start with number eight. And as far as the transformations for logarithms, I'm going to discuss that with you using Desmos in another video. So you can access that anytime because uh, at this point, this is a review as far as the transformations. Example eight is talking about the modeling of the height of children. They give you the function, so that is given. They're not gonna ask you to come up with this fabulous, you know, function. They do express several times in the question that X refers, and this is X, X refers to the years old, how many years old that child is, and particularly a male as they go through adolescence. So let me read you the question. It says, the percentage of adult height attained by a boy who is X years old can be modeled by F of X is equal to 29 plus 48.8 times the log of X, which is the age of the child, plus one. So that model is given to you. The question <coughs> begins where it says where x represents the boy's age from 5 to 15. So this is from age 5 to 15 years old. f of x is the percentage of the estimated adult height. So this is how old we expect the child to be. Approximately what percentage of his adult height has a boy attained at the age of eight? So you have to read carefully because they hide the information. So they're telling you that we're looking at F of eight because that's the child's uh, age. So this is equal to 29 plus 48.8 times the log of eight plus one, so basically nine. According to this, this child should be approximately, uh, re they've reached 76% of their height by age eight, if they are a male child, okay? So that's question number eight. And they will give you the age they're going to tell you X, so don't fret about that. So like I said, these questions are just plug it in and solve, basically. Let me talk to you about example nine. In example nine, they're talking about earthquake intensity. Okay, in this question, they're talking about the magnitude, which we define as R. So when you see a capital R, that is referring to the magnitude of an earthquake. They give you the formula and they tell you that R is equal to the log of the intensity of the earthquake over the initial intensity. Remember I sub zero, anytime you see I sub zero or uh, S sub zero, you know, um, we've done questions relating to this uh, in prior chapters. Anytime the su subscript is zero, it's initial, right? So in the question they say, um, in this particular case, it says, where I sub zero is the intensity of a barely felt zero level earthquake. So this is like the initial barely felt, um, we'll call it the initial uh, phase of the earthquake. It says the earthquake that destroyed San Francisco in 1906. So in 1906, there was an earthquake in San Francisco it had an intensity of 
raised to the 8.3 times as intense as a zero level earthquake. Okay, and so given that information, you're going to use that to substitute that into the formula. So go back to your formula, and in this case, we would say R is equal to the log of 10 raised to the 8.3. Again, initial intensity, so you're going to use that over I sub zero, which is the, uh, again, the same initial intensity of the earthquake. If you notice, the, the basics of this is that this will cancel. So when we use this part of the formula, the 10.83, um, I'm sorry, 10 raised to the 8.3, in it times the initial intensity. That's what they're referring to. So since this becomes basically initial intensity over initial intensity, you cancel it out. Your final answer in this, these types of equations are simply going to be 8.3 because this is log base 1010. If you recall, these are always, anytime you see a logarithm without an actual base, so if I, you see log no base, nothing, nothing expressed, say they say log base 100 equals, you would assume that there's a 10 here, and we know that this answer would be 2 because 10 squared is 100. So the base 10 is always an assumption uh, once it's there. So that actually cancels out the 10, leaving us just 8.3. Trust me, you'll have plenty of practice in your homework. I think you're going to be just fine with that question. All right, let's look at um, question 10. In example 10, the question is uh, basically asking you to find the domain. So that's what the nature of this question is. So finding the domain of natural logarithmic of natural logarithmic functions All right, and so they start us with example A. In example A, they're giving us f of x is equal to the natural log of 3 minus x. So I'm going to start with this one first. And so if you recall in this case, you're always going to focus right here at the 3 minus x. As a result, we know that 3 minus x has to be greater than zero. And then in this case, if I solve for the inequality, I will end up with x is less than three. That means that in terms of a number line, if I have the three here, here's negative infinity, here's positive infinity. I don't need positive infinity because x is a number that's sitting somewhere in this general vicinity. And so the result is um, I will either have an interval notation, negative infinity, comma, 3, or in subset notation, I will have x is in the set of values where x is less than 3. Okay? And so if you look at the figure um, in Desmos, for example, so let me go to Desmos and I'll just uh, use this. I want you to notice that it's actually, in concept, it's very similar to what we did with the logs. So here we go, Desmos. So y equals, 
natural log of, uh, what was it, 3 minus x. Okay, and if you notice, uh, technically, at x equal to positive 3, you will notice in the graph that this goes from uh, positive 3 because x has to be less than positive 3. So everywhere where we're at this asset vertical asymptote on to this direction, right? So if you notice, it's going to the left, and that's what we would expect. All right, let me do the second example. Okay. In the second example, they give us another function. So for part B, they're telling us h of x is equal to the natural log of x minus 3 squared. That's what's different, is that this is squared. So to solve for this, you have to understand that we have x minus 3, this is squared, and this has to be greater than 0. So technically, this is going to be all real numbers because it just simply cannot be 3. So you would say all real numbers except x can never equal 3 because that would make it zero. We cannot have that. And so our subset notation would be x is a value where x is not equal to 3. That's it. That's all you need to add to that, that subset notation. And in interval notation, again, if you're looking at a number line and here's the number 3, I've got to contend with negative infinity, positive infinity, so in interval notation, this becomes negative infinity comma 3 union. <clears throat> Sorry, wrong notation. I meant to do a parenthesis there. Again, union. Again, 3 not inclusive comma positive infinity. All right, and so when you look at the graph of this, this will actually look like you know, you have a value going like this, or a diagram going like this, and on this side approximating that 3, we're going this way. Remember, because this has to be greater than 0, we're still solving. And if I were to solve for this mathematically, let me show you this. So, 6 minus 3 squared, greater than 0, right? So, if I take the square root of both sides, square root of this, square root of this, I'm left with x minus 3 is greater than 0 because technically all I'm doing is canceling the power and the root. Square root of 0 is 0, and therefore x has to be greater than 0. But on the other end, we also have values on the opposite side because this is squared. Because it's squared, I have to look at both the positive and the negative. So technically, x is not only... Um, I'm sorry, I did something wrong here. I'm adding the 3. So x, ha x has to be greater than 3. My mistake. And then uh, on the contrary, x also has to be less than 3. And it has to have that dual... Because remember, square roots are plus and minuses, right? They're plus and minuses of each other. So you have to contend with both the negative and the positive. All right, and look at what it looks like in Desmos, because Desmos gives us a clear drawing. Go back here. So this time we're going to do um, x minus 3. And then we're raising this to the second power. This is what our diagram looks like on one hand. Um, again, this, this looks kind of strange. This is interesting. Let's see here. 
<clears throat> if you throw it into the calculator, it should be um, displaying both a negative three and a positive, or a negative and positive direction. So I'm not liking this diagram. I don't know what's going on here. Let me try to do this again. This may not be the best calculator to use for this then. Oh. Yeah, it's not it's not graphing properly here, but um technically what you should have um or see in your di diagram should look like this. So it'll have both sides where three is your cutoff. All right. All right, um, <clears throat> if you use your, your DI-83 calc calculator, <clears throat> you will notice, and if you also reduce your window, by the way, for you would have negative 10, 10, 1, by also negative 10, 10, 1. So negative 10, 10, 1. If you use the graphing calculator, once you explore this, go to y equals in your diagram, and you should have h of x, and then you're going to do natural log, in other words, y equals natural log of x minus 3 squared. In your calculator, you're going to get just this, just what you see on the, di on the diagram, okay? <clears throat> Let's take a look. At example 11, in example 11, we have heat in an enclosed vehicle. So dangerous heat in an enclosed in an enclosed vehicle. This is why they tell you never to leave a pet or a person um, locked in a vehicle. Because for some reason, the heat becomes extreme and rises quickly. If you've ever purchased a, an ice cream cone and walked in from the street and not turned on the car or turned on the air conditioning of any way you'll notice that ice cream cone will melt quickly another example where they're going to give you a formula they're going to give you a <clears throat> in this case 13.4 natural log x minus 11.6 and so in this question in the chapter that you're working in, <clears throat> they're going to ask you, um, let me see what the actual question is, um, trying to look for it. It says, how well does the function model the actual increase shown in minutes, basically? So what you have is basically you've been given a a series of charts where you have the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the y-axis and the minutes that it takes for this to actually um, increase in temperature. So the first temperature increase, um, which they model, is 19 degrees and then this happens close to uh, a 20 degree Fahrenheit there in terms of minutes this is after 10 minutes after 20 minutes there's another temperature increase and this one is about at 30 degrees Fahrenheit and so you have a chart basically here modeling 29 degrees in 20 minutes by 60 minutes you have 43 so this is extending up here this would be your 40 degree 
So this is going all the way up, all the way up, all the way up. And this would be about 43 degrees in terms of an increase. In between here, they model uh, 34 degrees in 30 minutes. And then you have 40 minutes, you're at 38. Then they do 41, which is 50 minutes. And so you have, you know, the various models as it increases little by little. All right, so in, in, in essence, um, if you're going to model for 50 minutes, which is what they asked you to do in the question, you are simply going to say 13.4 natural log of 50 minutes minus 11.6. And so basically F of 50 is what you're modeling. And this results in 41 degrees, which is what is stated here, right? When you actually finish this model off. So you're just a little bit over. All right. So again, these are the word problems. If you notice, what I'm trying to explain to you is in the question, they tell you exactly what X is. You just plug it in and use your calculator to solve. So that's not a big deal. All right, so I leave this to you.